Bellator 238 is going to go down on Saturday night in California. We're here to break this one down. Of course, that is Pete Rogers Jr. Of course, I am Jason Boy, the MMA Report Podcast. Of course, uh, Pete, uh, currently signed with CSMA. We're waiting to see when that next fight uh, may take place. Of course, we've seen Pete uh, inside the Bellator cage. But uh, Pete, uh, you know, Bellator... Last week, it was the UFC having their first event of 2020. This week, it's Bellator having their first event of 2020. Uh, and, and you look at these top four fights. These are, are four solid matchups that Bellator has put together. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, 2020 is going to be an action-packed uh, year for the sport of MMA. I'm super excited to break down this fight card with you. Um, you know, I love Bellator. I, I have a great relationship with Bellator. Um, some great memories with Bellator. So, uh, you know, um, Super, super stoked to break this down with you. Uh, you know, main event, Julia Budd and Chris Cyborg. This is one of these fights where, A, I think the betting line is off on this one. I think this fight is closer than the betting lines have it. I mean, I, I want to say the other day when I looked, Chris Cyborg was just over a, a three-to-one betting favorite. And I said on my show this week, call me crazy, but I'm picking Julia Budd to win this fight. And I know a lot. I, I know I'm going to be the minority on this one. I understand mm-hmm. it. But to me, the path to Julia Budd winning this fight, I think, is pretty simple. A, don't have a fight at range. You, you, you know, she's not going to win a fight uh, against Chris Cyborg by fighting range. But to me, it's closing a distance, getting Chris up against the fence, and using her grappling abilities. Of course, she's got to be careful because we can see what Chris can do there in the clinch. But this is one of those rare opportunities, Pete, where Chris, may, you know, I think, is going to be the smaller fighter on fight night. Yeah, I mean, uh, the big thing when you're facing Cyborg is uh, not getting overwhelmed by, you know, fighting the name Chris Cyborg and kind of being present in the moment. Um, You know, you're not fighting the name, you're fighting the person. If you can put that to the side and really focus on the task at hand, I think you could have some success. I think that's why Chris Cyborg was so successful in her career is because uh, similar to John Jones, uh, she beats her opponents before they step into the cage mentally. Um, You know, it's... It's that X factor, and you don't really know how somebody's going to respond until they're in the cage. Uh, I think Julia Budd doesn't seem too intimidated uh, against Chris Cyborg, and I think that's a a great sign for sure. Um, You know, with Chris Cyborg, it's easy to say now that the path to victory would be, um, you know, by clipping her on the chin since we saw what Amanda Nunez did. But if you look early on in her career, she struggled against people that really just stepped up the game and and brought the fight to her striking-wise. So... You know, if Julia Budd was an exceptional striker, I think I'd really like this matchup more. Um, The size, though, is the the X factor for Julia Budd. She's never, Cyborg's really never faced somebody, you know, as big as Julia Budd, and that could press that grappling exchange so much. I think people underestimate Chris Cyborg's grappling credentials and her ability, but it's going to be a close fight. I, I do think that Chris Cyborg might, you know, squeak this one out via decision. But I do think Julie Budd's going to show that she's right there, you know, and, and, you know, the level is is very similar. So I wouldn't be surprised to see Julia Budd win. It's just, can they keep up the pace? And Chris Cyborg's, you know, resume, she's been in big fights before. I kind of have to side with Chris Cyborg. You know, one of the things that, that stuck out to me on Thursday when they did media day and they had the two square off and you, you mm-hmm. see very similar sizes. One of the things that someone else pointed out is that, Notice how Julia Budd was in regular shoes. Chris Cyborg's in heels. And so you're going to see, you know, Julia Budd's probably going to have a little sure. bit of a height advantage. And then it's also interesting when, you know, Chris Cyborg, we all know, you know, making 145 is a tough cut for her. Everyone knows that. The fact that she came in at 143 and a half is kind of interesting. You wonder maybe is that maybe just had a bad scale, you know, that she was weighing in on, just wasn't calibrated. Uh, correctly, but uh, you know when you look at that weigh-in pictures between the two, it, it looked like I mean most likely a, a tough cut for Chris Cyborg and Julia Budd looked looked great on the scale. Yeah, I mean Julia Budd looked you know incredible on the scale. And when it comes to uh, cutting weight and sucking weight so much, the the one thing that's going to be affected the most is grappling exchanges. Uh, you know your cardio is going to go out the window if you really had a bad cut. Um, so that could be the worry for me with Chris Cyborg is that maybe she did have a bad cut. Maybe maybe uh, 45 is too much. You know what I mean? Like she's getting older. She's had a long career. Um, you know, such a grappling heavy approach from Julia Budd could be a problem. Yeah, it's it's going to be really interesting to kind of see how this one plays out. But, you know, I'm looking forward to watching this matchup. Now, I will tell you, the fight that I believe is the fight of the weekend, and that is the co-main event, which is 
Darian Caldwell versus Adam Borax, a quarterfinal matchup in the Featherweight World Grand Prix. Uh, this is one of those fights. It's just going to be kind of interesting to see how it does play out. I mean, obviously, Darian mm-hmm. Caldwell, you think of that fighter, that you know, strong wrestling base. Adam Borax has had some highlight reel, flying knee knockouts, trains down at Hard Knocks, uh, 365. Uh, you know, I know listening to Josh Thompson and, and John McCarthy's podcast, I guess apparently Adam Borks is a guy that goes hard in training. Um, and some fighters don't necessarily, you know, I mean, you know this. There's there's some fighters that necessarily don't want to. And apparently one of those fighters that just doesn't train with him anymore is Michael Chandler. You know, Michael's obviously, you know, Michael's not 22, 23 years old. You know, Michael, you know, isn't trying to get that, you know, that super hard uh, training session in there. But to me, if I'm Adam Borax, and I know Darren Caldwell does not like this narrative that is out there on him is the fact that he doesn't have the gas tank. But I have to imagine if you're Henry Hoof and you're that entire, you know, Hard Knocks 365 team, I think the thought is, hey, let's try to wear down Darren Caldwell and try to take advantage rounds three, rounds four, round five. Now, Darren Caldwell, on the other hand, he probably goes back and look at that fight that Adam Borax had against Aaron Pico and the success that Pico had with takedowns. And Darren Caldwell is yeah. probably like, hey, I can take advantage of that. Yeah, I, I think Darian Caldwell's, you know, wrestling is on such a high, high level. And uh, people may forget how, how talented he is on the mat. Um, but, you know, in Adam Bork's fights, he is usually just one strike away from ending it. But sometimes he gets caught behind on the scorecards or, you know, he gets taken down. So my worry is that Darian Caldwell just takes him down and controls him and really just kind of dominates him for early rounds. Um, and then Bork really has to dig himself out of a huge, huge hole. And, you know, you can get away with it sometimes, but at the higher level, you know, of the sport, sometimes you're just not going to find that lucky shot and your luck's going to run out. So, um, you know, these nice flying knees that he's getting and uh, great highlights. But I think this could be a uh, a standout performance from Darian Caldwell. I really think that uh, he's going to, to move on to the next round. I had Adam Borks on a podcast two weeks ago, and I want to tell you about what his mindset is. I, I want to see if you're digging this one. Keep it right. simple, stupid. <laughs> My dad repeats that all the time. It's true, but you know, you know that's that's that Henry Hoof, um, you know, mindset for the whole camp. It's just they they don't really do flash. You know, there's not so much flash. It's it's all about you know straight punches, getting behind the jab, um, good knees up the middle. There's nothing too advanced. It's just sticking to the basics. And uh, you know, when you build a a good foundation, you really start to have success, especially on you know even on the high level of the sport. Now there, I picked Adam Borax on my show this week. And, and, and I said, on my show, a, a big reason why I'm picking him. And there is no technical advice on this one. I want to see Adam Borax versus AJ McKee in the next round. Oof, that'd be crazy. I think either way, I mean, this, this featherweight tournament is just incredible. Um, you know, even if Caldwell moves on, I, I love his chances. It's just uh, exceptional matchups. But uh, that would definitely be, you know, very interesting. And something you have to note, it's a five-round fight. This is not yeah. a three-round fight. So if, you know, obviously Caldwell, you know, and one of the things, and I mean, you can talk about this, is when you know you're taking on a wrestler, because I've heard other, you know, fighters talk about this, is if that guy goes for a takedown in the last minute, last 30 seconds of the round, that you want to yep. make make that fighter work as hard as possible in that last 36 seconds to, to attempt to wear down that gas tank. You kind of expand on, on that mindset. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, you, you want to just make, you know, the wrestler grind, but you know, the thing about wrestling is it's, you know, it is a grind. So sometimes, especially on the high level, like I really don't think that strategy is the best against Darian Caldwell when he's seen it all. And he's really grinded more than anybody on the card when it comes to, uh, to grappling. So, um, I, I think Adam Borks, he should look to really establish range, um, make sure that he's using, you know, moving his feet a little bit. If he stays in front of Darian Caldwell, Caldwell's just going to be setting up a takedown, and I think it could be pretty easy. Uh, or it's, should it really look to capitalize too late in a fight? Like, because then you're, you're digging yourself out of a hole. So I, I think that he needs to just go in there and uh, not really worry about the five rounds so much, but, but don't go crazy first round. You know what I mean? Like he has to make sure that he's landing his good shots. Cause if you're not threatening Darian Caldwell, those takedowns are coming easy. So I think he needs to start to show the knee, show the uppercut so that Darian Caldwell starts to really second guess his approach. You know, speaking of featherweights, we've also got another featherweight matchup on this main card, two fighters that 
uh, were unsuccessful in the opening round of this Grand Prix, and that's Henry Corrales and Juan Archuleta. This fight was announced, I want to say, like two, two and a half weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago. And I spoke to uh, Henry late last week, and I said, hey, "Hey, man, how long have you known about this fight?" He's like, "It's like, dude, I've known for like seven weeks." He goes, "He goes, it was kind of getting that point. I was like, hey, are they ever going to announce this fight?" Yeah. Um, this is on paper. I think this has a chance to potentially steal the show on on Saturday night. Uh, but I think that's more based on does Juan Archuleta decide to get into a stand up fight with Henry Kraus? I, I am sure. Juan and his team, they went back and they looked at that film when Henry lost to Darren Caldwell, and I, they're probably sitting there thinking that, hey, let, let's just try to take Henry to the ground here. Um, you know, But this is a fight. If it stays on the feet, this could be a really fun fight. Yeah, I mean, I think it's going to be a fun fight regardless. I mean, for Juan Archuleta, I think he needs to use what got him you know, to the show, and that's mixing everything up. It's not sticking to just striking or just wrestling. It's it's mixing everything, and uh, I, I think if you go in there with a, a one-sided approach against somebody who's a seasoned vet like Henry Henry Corrales, uh, we've seen Henry, Henry Corrales come back from, uh, you know, from, from a big hole and, and land a nice knockout shot, but he's also a sneaky fighter. Like, uh, he tends to do well as the fight goes on and uh, sometimes squeaks out decisions. So uh, I, I think that this could be a a very close matchup standing up. I do like Juan Archuleta's chances of getting it done. I think he just has more ways to win. Um, comes from a great camp as well. So uh, for me, I like Juan Archuleta in the tournament, but I, you know, that that early matchup was tough, of course. But uh, you know, that's how brackets fall sometimes. But I think Juan Archuleta gets it done here. Yeah, I uh, I'm, I'm going with Henry Kraus, but I, you know, this is full disclosure. I, you know. I've been talking to Henry Krause for years. Um, you know, so I'd be like, Hey Pete, you're in a fight. You be getting underdog. I'm still picking Pete. You know? <laughs> Appreciate that. Wait, look, Appreciate look, that. this, this is the reality is we all kind of, you know, when you, you, you build a relationship, you know, with an athlete, you know, but uh, you know, I think obviously I think Henry's got to definitely keep it on the feet. Um, yeah. I think, I think the question with him is, um, you know, if, if Juan does try to make it into a wrestling game, and I think if you're going to look at any criticisms, of Henry from that fight against Darren Caldwell's, he was looking for that one shot. He wasn't putting yeah. things together. So I, I would imagine, you know, the team that are fight ready has really kind of, you know, hammered that into him leading up to this camp. Main cards also got the Bellator debut with Sergio Pettis. Uh, you know, it's, he's taking on a, a striker here at Alfred. Uh, you know, Alfred's got, you know, some speed and some power. I, I think more technically I, I would favor Sergio in this one. But, you know, obviously we saw Sergio at 125 in the UFC and 135. Of course, this fight is at 135 pounds. Uh, you know, when I talked to him two weeks ago, um, you know, he kind of essentially mentioned that he didn't even really realize that he was a free agent once his last fight was over and then just kind of everything kind of happened. And, you know, just said that it was too good of an opportunity to pass up, which uh, I took as they put so much money on the table, I couldn't turn it down. That's the way I took it because – He's even kind of pointed out there that, you know, he feels that, you know, he could be back in the UFC at, at some point. Um, this yeah. is a fight that I think has three, 15 minutes written all over because that's just yeah. kind of who Sergio is when you really think about yeah. it. I was just going to say, I, I mean, it says Sergio Pettis, so I automatically assume it's going to go the full 15 minutes. Um, you know, he's great. He's talented. He's, he's you know, very exceptional, especially, you know, in the UFC. He just knows how to, how to win. He knows how to win rounds. Um, so some fighters know how to win fights where, you know, the last second they can put something together. Um, uh, when I think of that, I think of like Derek Lewis, where sometimes he's losing a fight, but then he, he just rallies and gets a big win. But, uh, I think Sergio Pettis is so intelligent in the sport, um, that he knows how to squeak out rounds and, you know, get that edge. Um, for me, I, I think Sergio Pettis gets it done and I, I don't really think he struggles too much. I think against, uh, Alfred, he's gonna, you know, just kind of dominate him on the peak a little bit. I think it's going to be more of like an outpointing situation. Mm -hmm. But we've seen Alfred struggle on the feet before. I mean, getting clipped and knocked out on, you know, the contender series. But, uh, you know, that's no slouch against Lee Lawson and John O'Malley. But at, I think that this is Pettis' fight, and they want to build Pettis within Bellator, of course. So I think this is a tailored main matchup for him. And when you look at the the first two fights on the main card, kind of, you know, alluding to what you're just saying, that there's – there's definitely a fighters that, uh, you know, Bellator's trying to build. And Raymond Daniels, yeah. obviously everyone knows about Raymond and his striking abilities. And also Ava Knight coming over from boxing. Um, you know, and, and their opponents are a husband and wife combination. 
Jason King and Emily King, um, both uh, training out of Knoxville uh, Mixed Martial Arts Academy. Uh, they're in Knoxville, Tennessee, under Eric Turner, of course, Eric, the head coach of Owen St. Pru. And uh, this is uh, kind of the, the the inside MMA story of this is uh, Tim Lloyd, the matchmaker of Valor. Uh, you know, he is someone that has gotten uh, some fighters in the Bellator. I was actually talking to Tim the other night. He now believes he's three and three with the uh, fighters he's gone in there. Corey Browning's been the most notable uh, fighter uh, who has yeah. come there, fought Baby Slice, and fought uh, Aaron Chalmers, won both of those fights. Uh, you mm-hmm. know, in, in terms of the Raymond Daniels, Jason King fight, Jason is a striker. So I think stylistically, this type of matchup that, uh, you know, you want to, if if you're the Bellator matchmaker, this is the type of fight you want for Raymond Daniels. You don't want to put Raymond Daniels up there against, you know, someone who's going to look for a, a double leg takedown immediately, even though I think Jason will try to get this fight to the ground. Uh, even though Jason especially is striking, I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, you know, for Emily King, I, the, the fact is, I think it's no question. You don't want to sit there and have a striking match with Ava Knight. You want to try right. to get the fight to the ground. Um, but, I mean, look. This is what a lot of people would call showcase fights. You know, there's a clear A side of the fight. There's a clear B side of the fight. Um, you know, so we'll see how Jason and Emily do there. But, uh, you know, Raymond Daniels is a guy that, you know, he, you know, we saw in his last fight. The guy can do some just crazy strikes and he can knock you out at any moment. Yeah, I mean, I, I grew up in the karate circuit. So I, every weekend I was competing in karate tournaments with my dad and, you know, the Mohegan Sun National karate team and all of that stuff. So, um, our team used to compete against Raymond Daniels, like, you know, very often. So some of our fighters, I used to watch Raymond Daniels back when I was a kid. Um, I was like 12, 13, but so I grew up around, you know, watching Raymond Daniels a lot and his distance, distance controls, you know, crazy. He is so flashy. He's so technical. He's just a long, tricky fighter to figure out. And the thing about point karate is the movement. So he's not going to be like a tie fighter where he stands still and just plod forward, and then it's easy to set up a takedown. Uh, with somebody like Raymond Daniels, who's in and out and moving all around and cutting angles, it's almost impossible to get inside unless you've really trained with somebody at that level. So I, I think this is going to be another highlight reel for Raymond Daniels. I, I do think that the question always is, you know, what happens if he gets taken down? Early on in his career, we've seen what happens. He, he, he looks like a fish out of water, but I'm sure he's been training that for a very long time, and you know, you have to be training that, especially in an MMA belt or making that conversion to MMA. So my pick's Raymond Daniels. I think it's just going to be, you know, a nice decision or possibly get a finish just going to, you know, light up Jason King. I think a matchup that Bellator is hopefully searching for eventually would be Michael Venom Page against Raymond Daniels as, as things progress in Raymond Daniels' career. I think that would be, you know, two point karate fighters at the highest level competing it'd just be you know a spectacular fight in the Ava Knight against Emily King fight I do think that Ava Knight obviously is the A side good striker good boxer um Emily does have some submission wins and some submission losses so um the thing that worries me is when when a husband and wife are fighting on the card what happens when one fighter loses or you know if one fighter loses does that affect you mentally like if say Emily fights early on and, and she gets destroyed, how no, is that going to They're back to back fights, Pete. Them? That's what I'm saying. So like Yeah, I know I was gonna like bring that up. Like I mean, yeah. like if you're Jay you know, and here's the other thing is I, I, I know Eric's out there with um them. Um Eric's wife is also a fighter, Taylor Turner, she's yep. there uh help cornering. So it's kind of like I, I kind of wonder how that's gonna work, you know, for, for Emily's fight when Jason's a very next fight. I mean that to me is it's, it should have been spread out. I mean, honestly, it's probably too good of an opportunity to pass up for both of them. Mm-hmm. Um, it's kind of a fight you don't turn down, like it, especially if you want to make that splash or you think that you can have some success. Uh, I think Jason's only way for success is, is taking him to the mat. So if you accept this fight, you have to know the risk. But the back-to-back thing is a little worrying for me. And, um, you know, I, I think it just could be a hard and tough night for both of them. But, uh, you know, best of luck to them, and I, I hope they pull it off. Yeah, when Bellator gives you this type of call, it, it's tough to really turn down because I, I don't know this for sure, but I'm probably – I think it's probably a safe bet the fact that Bellator has, you know, said, hey, you're going to get another fight after this. This isn't a right. a, a one-and-done thing. So, yeah, it's something they have to do. Uh, preliminary card, uh, obviously there, there's some notable names on the preliminary card that people will, will know, Curtis Millinder. Uh, obviously Aaron Pico, I think is always going to be kind of what you see his name and, 
Um, you know, I said on my show this week, I think for Aaron Pico, um, you know, obviously now um, second camp at Jackson Wink, I, I expect we're going to see more of, uh, you know, the, the wrestler Aaron Pico, not necessarily yeah. the striker here. Um, of course, Daniel Carey, I mean, look, everyone thought he was going to lose his last fight against Gaston, Gaston Bolanos, goes out there and chokes him out. And, you know, that to me, for Aaron Pico, when you watch the film of him, the one thing that really sticks out to you is when he goes for his takedowns, he leaves that head out there, and you know Daniel uh-huh. Carey and his team is sitting there, and they're like, "Hey, all right, be, be ready. Take it. if he goes to that takedown, you know, look for that guillotine once again." That's a fight that, that interests me. Um, JJ Wilson, a, an undefeated one forty five er, he is someone to pay attention to uh, on, on this card. Is there anything else that kind of sticks out to you about the pre- prelims? No, I mean, I think people will be tuning in for Pico. I, I think that people want to see him succeed. I mean, he's faced some uh, some trouble times in the cage. I think that he gets back to his winning ways, though. Um, he has more ways to win. He's got a good coaching staff behind him. I know they haven't really succeeded too much lately. But I think that if anybody can get into the mind of Aaron Pico and right the ship, I think it's Greg Jackson. Um, Curtis Millinder, I've always been a fan of him. I like him. I watched him fight live. So I'm going to root for him always. I think that this is a nice matchup for him. He can get it done. AJ Agazarm, I, he's a talented grappler. Uh, he might be overlooked on the card. I think that he could also get a nice performance. Um, JJ Wilson, you spoke of. And then, uh, you know, some local matchups as well. So, you know, top to bottom, it's a, it's a nice card. And I think people will be extremely interested in the main card for sure. So uh, kicking off 2020 very nicely. Yeah, should be should be a, a great night of fights. I mean, Pico... You've gone through a couple of gyms, so has he finally found yeah. that right gym for him? I mean, you know, he, I know he did oh. a, a very little amount of training, aka kind of when he started, uh, went down the body shop, and now at Jackson Wink, so you kind of wonder, has he finally hit that? But, yeah, you tell me, Aaron, uh, this is one thing about Aaron Pico. Uh, he doesn't put on boring fights. The guy goes out there and puts on exciting fights, and at the end of the day, that that's all we, we can look for. Hopefully, uh, this is an exciting night of fights, of course, uh, uh, there's no daily fancy on uh, on Bellator, but uh, if you Not are yet. look, but Not yet. I'm hoping, if, yeah. But if you are looking to, to uh, play a little uh, DFS, uh, be sure to check out the, our DFS show here on the Ameriport YouTube channel. As me and Pete are breaking down UFC Raleigh, which is also on Saturday night, so you can take in a lot of MMA on Saturday night. UFC starts uh, early. I want to say the prelims start like five o'clock. Main card eight p.m. and then of course uh, the Bellator prelims will start at seven thirty p.m. Eastern time. And main card, 10 p.m. Eastern time on DAZN. So, as always, uh, myself and Pete appreciate you taking time out of your day to, to watch our channel. And this has been the MA Report Bellator 238 preview show.